Great, thank you very much for those uh, kind words, Basil. Uh, what I would say, actually, uh, just on a bit about market capitalisation or you know, capital markets, actually Z is the largest capital listing uh, that's a not a government SOE type thing since Telecom in 1991. I think some of us might forget that uh, as much as we think Telecom was owned by the government, they were actually sold to American shareholders and then eventually listed. So as much as we're proud to be able to bring you know, some exposure to our sector to the capital markets in New Zealand, it sort of says something about our capital markets where you know, Z can come to market and we're the biggest listing for, for 20 odd years. So certainly something to think about and I'm sure when you run a series on capital markets I'd like to see, have someone speak a little bit about, about Z. Uh, so I'm really pleased to be able to share a few thoughts with you today. Uh, I, I will say some things that I will introduce that uh, may sound like I'm taking a position on something and I'd just like to say I'm not. I'm just trying to share some things that would uh, provoke thought. So for example I'll talk a bit about fracking. And I know that's particularly controversial and I'm not declaring whether I think it's good or bad. In some respects I don't know enough to have a, a real opinion on that. But I want to introduce some things to actually uh, provoke thinking and to stimulate discussion. Because one of the reasons that uh, we choose to do things like this, or, or me in particular, is because I think New Zealand could do with some thought leadership in this space. So in a, in a role like mine, particularly when we are a public company, uh, I get, even yesterday I had three invitations to speak at various conferences. And what we do in Z is we, we limit what we speak about because we actually want to provide, uh, I think I'm going, yep. I want to provide um, thought leadership. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep. yep. I want to make sure that we provide thought leadership and clearly any company can't provide thought or I guess shouldn't provide thought leadership on everything. So we choose to provide thought leadership on a limited number of things. And, and certainly our focus in the last two years is to, is to, be, uh, is to be available to provide thought leadership around you know, fossil fuels and sustainability. And again, that thought leadership isn't here are our ideas and everyone must believe them, it's actually we want to stimulate discussions. So as I talk today, please engage with me on, on, on that basis. And equally, when you think about it, you know, why would you want to listen to me anyway? Because I am one of the world's filthiest polluters. Uh, in terms of the products that we sell, we contribute to about 90% of consumers' carbon emissions and about 25% on average of company carbon emissions in New Zealand. So why the heck would someone like me want to come along and talk about fossil fuels given the pollution that I spew out and sustainability? Well, part of it is you know, we've got to do something about this. Uh, I come from a big oil background. I spent 25 years with BP, 17 years outside of New Zealand. And I learned a lot of stuff. I learned what companies like that do well. I learned what companies like that fail on and how other people think about companies like that. And with Z, given that we're, you know, we're only so small, we only care about New Zealand, uh, and actually we have no upstream interests, so we don't have billions of dollars invested in upstream production where we've got to find a way to monetize the oil that we produce or the gas that we produce. We just happen to sell transport fuels. And the transport fuel that we sell at the moment is a fossil fuel, and that seems to be the one that's most economic. But actually as a company we're ambivalent about whether we sell fossil fuels, electrons, hydrogen, biofuel, any other type of liquid fuel. If it requires a distributed network, and it's most likely to be a high fixed cost, low margin business. Well, we already have a business model around that. Right, so again, we're really ambivalent around actually what we sell. And when you start to frame up a paradigm, and again, you see from the title of my, my talk today, it is about you know, existing paradoxes or new paradigms. We work a lot inside Z to try and reframe things or put it into another paradigm to open up an avenue for us to explore, to us to inquire into, for us to provide thought leadership on, and ultimately for us to do something about. So I'm not here today as a representative of, of, of Big Oil. Uh, I'm here today as somebody who sells transport fuels and recognising the need that that has for the energy requirements in New Zealand, and actually there's a chance for so us to do something about that. Because we really are the gatekeepers to the industry. If we don't, if we don't change, or the government doesn't force us to change, nothing will change. And I'm just not too sure that I want to sit around and wait for whatever else happens that forces the change, which I guess many people would think, particularly after the IPCC uh, report on, fr on Friday, says probably it's going to be more cataclysmic that will finally cause a change rather than people getting committed about, about stuff. So we want to be responsible and become accountable for what we do. Because uh, we believe we have this really unique set of circumstances. We're, we're here in New Zealand, we only care about New Zealand, we're ambivalent about what we sell, provided we can make a return for our shareholders. And in actual fact, there's a lot more that we could be doing. <clears throat> and there, up, up there is a list of things that Z holds to be true. 
And we actually embarked upon uh, a, a bit of listening when we first started the company. And yeah, we took over from Shell in April 2010. And we conducted one of the largest pieces of research ever conducted in New Zealand. And we effectively listened to what 17,000 people had to say. Now that's the equivalent of stopping everybody in Ashburton, offering them a cup of tea and a scone, and sitting down and listening to, to, you know, to what's on their mind. And after all of that, we had a great deal of feedback about what we could do or couldn't do about our service stations, our customer offers, about our participation in commercial markets, all the stuff you'd expect. But equally, we got a lot of feedback around how people view a company like us, what they think about our brand, what their expectations are of us around our environmental impact, our social impact, not just our economic impact. So we put all that together and we said, actually, there's a bunch of things we could do here. And we, can, we also did, and I, I'm sort of conscious of uh, Duncan's is here in the room. I, um, I, along with my general manager of corporate who deals with our strategy stuff, we put our hands out after all that research. We said, look, we, yeah, if you like, the people in New Zealand have spoken, but actually we need to get a bit of expertise. So we went out and we had what we called sustainability dinners. And I invited a, a number of people, most of whom wouldn't want to be seen in the same restaurant as myself, frankly, mm -hmm. uh, to sit down and say, could we talk about sustainability? So we, we invited people from the Green Party, we invited people from NGOs, we invited the ex-parliamentary commissioner for the environment, we invited Al Morrison from uh, DOC, and, and, and so it goes on. And these weren't always comfortable uh, invitations to issue. So in, in many cases, I actually wrote a two-page personal letter to all of those people, almost pleading them to put, along, put to the side their bias against someone like me to engage in a, in a conversation. And so we, got, we had four of these dinners of uh, gatherings of about four to five, five people. And we just sat down and, and we said, okay, well, what do you think we could do? And we just got all this wonderful expertise and feedback. And it wasn't always comfortable, but what we'd do at the end of the night, we'd, I'd sit down with my uh, general manager of corporate, uh, Lindis, and we'd sit down and we'd, just, we'd then document up everything that we'd heard. And so when those people got back to their offices or their organisations the next day, they had a documentation, a, a written record of what we'd heard, so they had the chance to ch we had a chance to check that we'd heard things correctly. And that really helped inform us a great deal, that we eventually said, this is what we stand for. You know, so there's, there's evidence out there that says you know, climate change is real and it's caused by human activity. Well, that's one place to start. But we equally said, these are the things that we stand by, and we're happy to be held accountable for that. And that formed the basis of, it's about two pages, I think, our sustainability policy, which we have published on the web, uh, that we've put, we've set some long-term goals around that, and we make ourselves accountable through the annual review about how well we're doing on those things. So yeah, from the very, very get-go, by the end of, uh, this would have been end of 2010, we're already in the game. And what I mean by we're in the game is we've made public statements, and now if we back off those, we look like idiots. Yeah, and then we undermine our reputation, and particularly our brand, which eventually became the Z brand. It wasn't Z in the beginning. So the key thing is, we're in the game, we are gatekeepers to the industry and nothing will change unless a company like us does something about it. So we have four pillars for sustainability. Uh, first one is use less and, and waste less. My, my view there is if you don't take care of your own back garden, then you're not really in the game. Or you don't really have the right to uh, work with your customers or work with other parts of the New Zealand business community and, and talk about what you could do. So what we're doing there is all the obvious things that you would expect us to do. Yeah, we've got... Uh, Waste no longer going to uh, landfill. We put 40 tonnes in the last year, 40 tonnes of food waste has gone to compost rather than landfill. Uh, we're replacing all the under canopy lights on our service stations. Uh, Two and a half million dollars spend uh, will save 50% uh, of our costs in energy. We'll reduce our carbon emissions for that part of our business by 16% and effectively you know, create enough, free up enough energy to power 350 homes across New Zealand. Um, all of our company cars are hybrids. Yeah? So as, they, as the leases on the old vehicles run off, they're all moving into, into hybrid vehicles. So we're doing a bunch of stuff that you'd sort of expect us to do. But here's the real kicker. If, uh, if you thought about the carbon emissions that are a result of our activity, and you, you, you called them seats on an aeroplane. So seat 1A is everything we do in our offices and all of our service stations. That's how much carbon we emit, seat 1A. Seat 1B is the carbon that gets emitted from on our entire supply chain, from boats that bring crude to New Zealand, for the boats that move products around the country, and all the trucks that deliver those products to service stations and commercial customers. So 1A and 1B. If you then took the next four rows, that's the equivalent of the carbon that gets thrown out of our share of the New Zealand refining company. So 1A 
is just us, one B's our supply chain, four more rows is what comes out of the refinery. And it's another two and a half planes of seats that actually come from the carbon emissions from the products that our customers eventually use. So although it's important to get after you know, seat 1A and making that, if you like, as small as possible, if you, if you stick with the metaphor, the really big issue is actually in how customers use our products. So we're going to use less and waste less. We are going to reduce the carbon intensity of what we do and the products that people use. And we've got some ideas, and I'll share a couple of specifics later on, about how we actually get customers to use less of our products. Now, most people say to me, uh, Mike, you must be an absolute idiot. Why, would, why do you want people to use less of your products? Because that sort of seems to be the antithesis of what companies should do. They want people to use more of their products or services because that's where profits come from. But again, here's, a, here's another way to shape the paradigm. Uh, inside Z, our post-tax profits are about three cents a litre, believe it or not. Now, you multiply it by two and a half billion litres and it adds up to quite a large amount of money. But it's three and a half cents a litre. So what we said to ourselves, the paradigm we've created, is we could sell 20% less, but if the price of our products went up by 5%, we're actually more profitable. So I'll say that again. If we sold 20% less of our products, but we put the selling price up by 5%, we would be more profitable. So if I could find some way to come to you and say, I've found a technology or some other thing that enables you to save 20% 20, 20 of, of the consumption of our products, but I'd like you to pay 5% more per unit, well, you'd be the idiot not to take up that option. So again, this whole notion of reshaping the paradigm allows us to open up our thinking. So we've now said our success doesn't have to come from selling more. Our success comes from actually getting our unit margins up. So a whole lot of things open up to us when we think that actually, wow, what would a world be like if we sold 20% less and we made 5% more per unit? And by the way, if our industry sold 20% less across the whole industry, our commitment, or the lack of commitment to the Kyoto Protocol, would be met in full. So that's why the 20% is not just a number we dreamed up, it's actually, it has some other meaning beyond that. So we don't fear um, reducing our customers' carbon intensity. We clearly want to, get the, uh, want to wean them off fossil fuels, and as I mentioned before, we don't really mind what people buy, as long as it's a transport energy. We have a business model that enables us to be effective and efficient and generate returns for our shareholders for the risks that they take. So we actually want to reduce New Zealand's reliance on fossil fuels. And the last one is, we actually want to support New Zealand. So we think we have some very special responsibilities by being a New Zealand company. Now that's, that's changed a little bit in the last wee while. Originally we were owned by Infratil and you know, half owned by the New Zealand Superfund. So you know, many, you know, all of New Zealanders had an exposure to us through uh, the New Zealand Superfund. You know, but now we're a public company. You know, we've got more than 10,000 know, mums and dads who actually own a piece of Z today. So that only changed you know, on the 19th of August when we listed the company. So we think by being a Kiwi company, we have a lot more responsibilities. And indeed, the research told us that. What the research says, well, look, we're willing to give you guys a break as a Kiwi firm competing against the global guys. But gee, I tell you what, you better front up to some of the responsibilities. So if something goes wrong, we expect you to step in and sort it out. We expect you to take leadership on the things that really matter to us, beyond just giving us the goods that provide us the utility we need to use your products. So things like environment and the social outcomes, they have greater expectations of us than they do of some of the largest companies in the world against whom we compete. So how do we do that? Well, we, we, uh, when we rebranded, you know, we changed everything from Shell to Z, we went out of our way to actually use New Zealand signage manufacturers. So rather than just going to China and buying it cheap, like a lot of things that you do, when we went to the New Zealand manufacturers, some of them couldn't do it, and some of them certainly couldn't do it at the prices we were looking for. But we partnered with them, and we found a way to get it down. It wasn't as cheap as buying it from overseas, but it was within a reasonable range. But if you, have, if you, if you lead your business from that commitment, again, it, a lot more things become possible if you, ch if you change the paradigm. So we work very, very closely at doing what we can to support New Zealand. And probably the most visible aspect of that is uh, the Good in the Hood program, where we actually said, I, I find it it's fantastic for me now. I get so many requests to sponsor things and I say to people, I'm sorry, I don't have the authority to do that. Our customers decide where our sponsorship or our community investment dollars go. I don't, I don't, I don't get to do that anymore. And equally, we've done a lot of work around the 2,500 people who work on our service stations to actually help them upgrade their own skills. So we've recently had some graduates come through that program where they have some NZQA recognised qualifications now by their on-the-job experience with us and how we work with them to develop their own skills. 
So again, we're very much focused on equally social outcomes in the sustainability space as we are around uh, the environmental outcomes. So what we do is we uh, have set goals for all of those through to 2015. Uh, we've published them, they're in our annual review. And I've got to be honest with you, half of the goals we set, when we set them, we didn't know how to do it. Right, so you imagine what conversation that's like. Uh, actually, I have one of my directors in the room, and she wasn't a director at the time, but uh, uh, the, even the directors didn't even know about that. It was like, we've just got to stand for something big and, and put it out there. But what has opened up for us is a whole lot of things. One is we have to be a lot more innovative. We have to be a lot more participative and cooperative with people, because if you don't know what you don't know, or you don't know how to get something done, you've got to go about it in a really, really different way, because working harder is not going to solve it. So I fully expect that, you know, of the 16 goals that we put out there, there's probably four or five of those that we will not meet. And I wouldn't necessarily class that as failure because we'll have made substantial progress, but actually when you take a risk like that, you are going to end up with a certain amount of failure, if I could call it that. So when it comes to sustainability, and sort of get sort of cut to the, the, the guts of the whole fossil fuels debate, I think there are three things that are on the go that cause change in the world. And any one of these, and you know, clearly the, the metaphors there around, around the gears, any one of the gears can turn, but it's only through the interconnection of all three that actually you start to affect change. So if you take sort of the one down the bottom here, which is the, you know, clearly it's made big for a, for a reason, the whole environmental thing is, is really important. And as I said, you know, the IPCC put their report out on Friday, and you know, there's further scientific evidence or more people believing or higher probability that actually fossil fuels cause climate change. Equally, you've got this whole thing around the sort of the social aspect of things. So there is a small group of, of really committed people. There might be many when you put them on a global basis, but actually as a proportion of the population, it's still quite a small proportion of the population that are in action around doing something for environmental sustainability. And then when it comes to this whole economic thing, there's been a heck of a lot that's changed in this, in this space that I think uh, profoundly affects what was what the path we were on around moving away from fossil fuels. And you get the whole global financial crisis has, has fundamentally changed things. It's changed the company's willingness to take risk. It's changed people's affordability uh, around it. It's caused people to think twice about how and where they invest money, how much risk they're personally willing to take on versus what companies may want to take on. And you've got this whole notion that you yeah, sort of, and I can recall because I, I used to run a, a trade, an oil trading business, and I can recall being in the Middle East with you know, the people in the Middle East, the, the sheiks and all that, when oil went through $40 a barrel, and, I can t and that was in October of 2004, and they were not happy about that, because they thought that was going to be the end of, of their business, because that, that high price was going to completely crater demand, and it would force people into alternatives. Now I go back a year later, and oil's about $70 a barrel, and it's a completely different conversation. Now, a lot of people have forgotten, but in July of 2008, uh, we were on our way, we had $147 a barrel US oil. So the whole notion around alternative fuels and all that stuff, they had this massive momentum behind it that caused a whole lot of money to go into the sector, whether it be solar or alternatives to liquid transport fuels. And that's, com that's completely gone, in, in my view. It's not just the GFC, but the whole, the whole theory around peak oil, I think, has changed a lot, and indeed I think the price points around uh, crude are fundamentally different to where they were back in 2008. So things have changed quite a lot. There's actually a, a quote I'd like to read from, um, it was a BBC hard talk interview with um, the, one of the, the chief economists from the, um, the International Energy Agency. <coughs> and he talks a bit about um, subsidies on fossil fuels, because you may not know this, whatever the price point is, there's quite a lot of countries in the world that are subsidising fuel. And I'm not talking about the Middle East, but I'm talking about India, China, Malaysia, Indonesia. So some of the world's highest growth demand points for fossil fuels are subsidising the product. And he says, uh, fuel subsidies are the number one enemy of climate change. 90% of fuel subsidies go to the middle and upper classes. Right. Whereas we tend to think about subsidies as being things that subsidise. Poor people in those countries, they can't afford fuel. They're still burning wood or, or, or coal or some other product to actually meet their needs. They, aren't, they can't afford a car. They don't necessarily use LPG uh, for their cooking. So that's a really, really important point. You've got this massive price spike that might have been there, but part of that's always been insulated from the market because of what these countries are doing, uh, for, for their own good reasons. And he then goes on to say that uh, 
Carbon taxes are necessary to change behaviour as oil, gas and coal markets do not and will not give sufficient price signals. So I don't always agree with what the IEA have to say, and in some respects they're much more experts at what they do than I am. I, I tend to think they're a bit behind the pace. They, they get there but they're usually two or three years behind you know, where the market's at. But it's really interesting for me that the chief economist talks about the impact of fossil fuel subsidies where the demand is the strongest and he also talks about the need for price signals around carbon to cause a change in behaviour. So those gears are all grinding away. So I want to talk a little bit more now about uh, why things are changing. So again, pretty simple slide, the way it was and the way I think it is now. And do I think it is now? Again, I'm offering this up as a place to think from rather than it is the truth. So that's sort of the generosity I asked for early on. So before we used to live in a world of peak oil and oil was on its way to $200 a barrel. What I'd point to today is actually we are growing these non-conventional oil supplies. You know, and again, there's a consequence to that. But tar sands in Canada, shale oil and gas in the US, uh, deep water drilling, you know, they go down for miles now in the Gulf of Mexico or West Africa, or they go down a little bit and they go for miles horizontally before they drill down and get the stuff again. So there's a lot more non-conventional supplies that come onto the market. And they're called non-conventional because they weren't the way it was 20 years ago. But when some of these technologies or, or sources are available and they've been there for 20 years, I'm not sure you can call them non-conventional anymore because they are very much part of the mainstream. They've got this whole notion of the rise of uh, what is now called Saudi America. Uh, America used to be the world's largest importer of, of crude and, and, and products. By 2017, they will produce more oil than, than Saudi Arabia. By 2020, they will no longer be importing any oil. Now you've got to think about what does that do to the world's geopolitics when the US don't really care what happens in the Middle East anymore. All right, they spend a billion dollars a year on a carrier group in the Middle East making sure things are settled enough for oil to continue to flow to the US. Now 2017 is not that long away. I mean, if I was really clever, I'd tell you how many days it is. But you know, it's, yeah, it's about 1,250 odd days, isn't it? It's not that long before they become the world's largest oil producer. And actually I read some research uh, yesterday that said they could be there by 2015. So the fundamentally the world's changing. So this whole notion around peak oil theory or price points driving the move towards renewables or alternatives to fossil fuels, in my view, has, has greatly diminished. The second point is, you know, businesses, and you know, I, I happen to be responsible for one, we like a certain amount of certainty when we, when we get into stuff. And a lot, of that thing, a lot of that has become uncertain. So you've got the situation now where, you know, what is sometimes called the, the, the Great Recession, yeah, the world has changed, and I, I gave you some evidence for that earlier on. Uh, but equally, and again, um, Dr. Barol in, in his Hard Talk interview said, uh, in 2012, the year-on-year -year investment change in renewables declined for the first time in over a decade. All right, so even though we're now four or five years after the Great Recession, for the first time, there's been this year-on-year -year decline in investment in renewables compared to the previous decade. So, you know, I come from a market background, so you have market speak. The market is saying, actually, investment in alternatives to fossil fuels are less favourable today than they were a year ago and have been for the past decade. Sort of kind of interesting, at the same time, we've probably got more evidence around the need to do something about fossil fuels, given the impact on climate change. Then we come down to sort of the, you know, the regulatory space. Uh, there's quite a, quite a big move away from nuclear options. And what I mean by that, you know, a very tragic tsunami in Japan but it actually happened at a time there were a number of nuclear plants around the world that were up for relifing. And now I think even in Germany they've decided they're, they're going to close down some of their nuclear capacity. You know, Japan certainly closed it down. So again, I don't, have, I don't have a strong view on whether nuclear is better or worse, but you just think about an, an alternative to fossil fuels is actually there's much less capacity or demand, sorry, supply that's coming on stream there. I mean, clearly Kyoto too has been a failure and New Zealand's sort of put its yeah, colours to the mast and said we're not committed to that um, in the way that we were previously as well. You've got a situation where carbon prices have absolutely collapsed. New Zealand brought in an emissions trading scheme. It priced carbon units at $25 a tonne in, in, in Kiwi dollars. Uh, it wasn't that many months ago that I could have gone out and bought that and met my obligation at 20 cents. So 0.1% of what was put in place to drive behaviour change. The other thing I'd point out is that that behaviour change, it, it equates to about three cents a litre, $25 a tonne. Now you, I know that actually it's not so much the amount that causes the change in people's de, uh, 
demand for our products, it's a price point. So the first time prices go through $2 a litre, you can really see about 5% of demand backs off. But the second time you go through $2 a litre, because you do oscillate, then people are, oh, okay, I've got used to it a bit. And then it becomes two twenty, and so on. So for there to be a material change in consumers' behaviour in New Zealand, the carbon impact would have to be a heck of a lot more than three, three cents, given that we typically cycle through maybe 15 to 20 cents from top to bottom as you go through any particular year. This, this, uh, the US, which is the, uh, the foundation of all these free markets, there's some really weird stuff happening over there. They've recently, um, it, it was almost happened in the same week, they brought in legislation that said all new cars had to be at a consumption rate of six litres per 100 kilometres down from the previous nine, which is like, great. It just brings them into line with what had been in Europe for many, many years. And at the same week, there were a couple of states in the US that started taxing electric vehicles. <laughs> now, it could be that those electric vehicles are powered by coal-produced electricity, so maybe that's a good thing to do. But again, you think, that's sort of really odd that the signals that the regulator, the government, are sending to the market are causing, causing confusion. We want lower fuel consumption, but actually we're now going to make it harder for you economically to get into using your electric vehicle. And clearly there's inconsistency across New Zealand governments. You know, when I came back to, to, to New Zealand, uh, just after the government changed there, the previous Labour government had put a mandate in place for uh, biofuels. They said to the industry, whatever you sell, 5% of it must come from a biofuel. So it's a bit of a club, but it's one way to get change. And then before that, had barely had time for the ink to dry, the, the national government came in and said, we're going to put a biodiesel incentive in place. So no mandate, but if you want to get after it, we'll pay you an incentive to do that. So a lot of projects had stalled between government changes. So some projects go to start up, the government then say, look, no one's accessed the biodiesel grant, therefore clearly there's no need for it, so we're going to stop it completely. So it's like, you've got to go that way, no, then you've got to go that way, now that way's even stopped as well. So the whole point about this thing here is that all businesses really want, or certainly I as a, as a business leader really want, is just a certain degree of, well, a reasonable degree of certainty across a reasonable degree of time. Because whether it's you know, favourable to me or unfavourable, it enables me and my team to make good decisions, for us to bring our talents and skills to bear on whatever the regime is that we have to work within. But it's the certainty that I think is really important. So one of the disappointing things about the move to alternatives to fossil fuels is that it's subject to this, certainly in New Zealand, this government change. Now, I, you often hear that phrase, you know, bipartisan politics, particularly out of the US. Well, why can't, you know, the governments in New Zealand, the big decision makers in New Zealand, get some agreement on how we could deal with this that would span more than the three-year election cycle? So it's not particularly flash in terms of, you know, market impetus to change things. If I talked a little bit about um, shale, I'm just going to show a couple of quick slides here. I happened to uh, speak at a conference a couple of months ago, uh, I think it might have been in February, and um, uh, John Loughhead from uh, the UK Energy Research Council put this map up, and that's a map of the uh, black shale deposits in the UK. So again, a lot of people think about shale oil and gas as being a, an American phenomena. It's happened more there because they not only found the stuff, but they had an existing pipeline of gas and oil pipelines to move it around the country really quickly. The UK has some of that. But you know, that looks like a reasonable chunk of the UK where you could go off and do your own shale exploration and production. And here's a bit of data around uh, the US. Uh, the first figure there is just um, what they call the, the five states of Oklahoma, North Dakota, that sort of cluster uh, in, in America. And you see how you know, oil has declined and then in very recent times, through shale, oil and gas exploration, how it's just gone up through the roof. And the bottom graph just really shows you what's really happening around um, crude products and imports. You can see here that the US is now importing as, as little, or as much, depending on your perspective, as they were back in the mid-80s. And so we're only a couple of years, if you just follow that graph, that's why, maybe why by 2015 they are not importing anything. So that's really hard evidence of actually what's physically happening in markets and again I say whether you like fracking you don't like fracking and all the issues around it and there are clearly some issues around it the physical markets are, f are fundamentally changing and so that's why I, I'm, I'm not a believer of, of peak oil um, and, and I think that the price point pressure towards a turn of the fossil fuels is just not is just not going to be there okay, uh, in the US today it costs about 45 to 50 dollars a barrel to extract uh, shale oil and gas there's, there's people who, whose opinion I really value who suggest it will be down to $25 in the next five years, just through breakthroughs in, in technology. So imagine what that could do. 
in terms of people rushing to produce even more of the stuff. So not a, not a favourable environment really is it for, uh, for uh, the su supply side of the equation to cause some shift in the demand side. So we'll move on to something uh, even more positive, um, our Aussie friends. So believe it or not, I mean, uh, Cuba, Cuba PD in, in South Australia, most people know it as an oil producing area. Uh, this company Link Energy, and I've, I mean I had to dig to find this actually, they've had a discovery that could be anywhere between three and a half billion barrels of oil and 233 billion barrels of oil. The size almost of Saudi Arabia. Now they're currently in the market looking for about 150 to 300 million dollars to fund the next round of exploration to really prove out whether it's three and a half billion or 233 billion. You can imagine what that does. The Australians don't think twice about you know, digging up their country and, and monetizing uh, minerals. <laughs> so again, I just, want to, just really want to share those two with you to let you know the whole shale oil and gas thing is much more than an American phenomena. And as I said, I mean that is absolutely huge and it's just got no airtime uh, here at all. Actually a mate of mine sent it to me saying, yeah, do you realize and do you want to participate? And so actually no, we are, that's not what Z is all about, but gee, I find that really interesting in terms of what it may mean for uh, New Zealand. Talk a little bit about the practical steps that we're taking, because clearly I've, I've painted a relatively doomy and gloomy situation, so there's no, there's no real pressure on me from a supply side to do anything about this, but there are some practical steps that we're taking. So we're currently in, uh, looking at a, a tallow to diesel project, and this is where we take uh, inedible animal fats, so yeah, the, what's left over from dead cows, and which typically at the moment uh, gets exported to China for the use of making candles and soaps. But actually there's a technology that's available in New Zealand and uh, it's, well, it's, it's a common technology but there's a variant of it that's, that's pretty unique in New Zealand and so we've got the IP now that enables us to take that, that animal fat and turn it into a very high quality uh, biodiesel. So we could build a plant and we would make about 20 million litres of biodiesel a year or what's called B100, so 100% biofuel and we would then blend that into diesel at about a 5% and that will enable us to supply about two thirds of our service stations across the North Island and a number of our commercial customers. So a very small step, but actually yeah, well worth it. It uh, costs about $20 million, about $15 million to build the plant, and about $5 million to uh, actually upgrade our supply chain to be able to take that product and blend it, and blend it in. So that's not a lot of money. Yeah, we're over one, yeah, we've got $1.3 odd billion worth of assets. We spend this year about $100 million worth of capital, so $20 million isn't a heck of a lot. The really sad thing is it doesn't make any money. So, and actually it's quite hard to predict, you know, in a, in a classic NPV or internal rate of return sense, you know, what's it worth. So we, we do this clever stuff called Monte Carlo analysis, where you take all the potential variables and you model them and you tumble them a thousand times. So you take the extreme of the crude price, top and bottom, the extreme of diesel price, top and bottom, the extreme of tallow price, top and bottom. You come up with a thousand combinations, you put it in a big computer, wind the handle and out the bottom comes the answer that says, we have a 60% chance of losing money. So what do you do? If you know consumers aren't prepared to pay a premium for this product, if you know there's a, a compelling reason to do it from an environmental and perhaps even a social perspective, but economically it's an absolute bust. So uh, what you do is you try to change the paradigm. And, and you, you don't do that in a way that uh, fools yourself. But part of the way that I, I relate to it, and, and we'll make a decision on this project by December. So we're actually just finding a finalising the engineering work right now to know whether it will cost $20 million or, or even more. But I probably wouldn't think twice about spending $20 million on a marketing program over a five or six year period. In actual fact, we spend about $20 million a year on our marketing programs. So perhaps one way to relate to this is to say this is about building a brand, it's about pioneering a technology, it's about proving out something in our supply chain ahead of when a more economic alternative might come along. So sometimes, you know, you know business leaders and boards relate to capital as being different to marketing budgets. I mean, it's all just cash at the end of the day and there's a different accounting treatment, I'll, I'll concede that. But again, this whole notion of changing the paradigm. Now, I wouldn't want you to hear that as being, um, I'm as loose as a goose on money, uh, or we don't really care about this stuff, or we're another incarnation of, of solid energy. Not that at all. All, all, I'm, all I'm doing is saying that we have a natural reason for being in this market. There's more at stake here than just the economics. And how can we frame it in a way that doesn't make us irresponsible as business leaders, but actually gets us into the game. So we'll have something to say about that probably early in the, in the new year. The second thing we're doing is we partnered with North Skog um, in what we uh, very cleverly call our stump to pump strategy. 
And this is where we take uh, uh, woody biomass, so sawdust and, and, and waste on the forest floor, and we put it through a very clever technology. You squeeze it really hard, you apply a whole lot of heat to it, and at the back end of that comes either a, a feedstock that you could take up and put into the refinery, so a bit like a green crude, if I could use that expression, or you treat it a little bit more and you turn it into a diesel or even maybe into some type of petrol um, at the plant. Uh, we're very generously supported by a government grant around that, a primary growth partnership grant, so it didn't come to us as the oil industry, it went to Norski in terms of trying to actually do something in the forest space, which is clearly quite an important industry uh, for New Zealand. And so between the government grant, Norski and ourselves, we're spending $13 million undertaking a commercial and technical feasibility study that will complete in about a year's time about whether or not we should go ahead with the project. And going ahead with the, and so $30 million in itself is a lot of money because if you do decide to go ahead, it might cost anywhere between 80 to $100 million to build the plant. But the really cool thing here is not only do you get the, uh, the cleaner products in terms of what we sell at the back end, but you really start to deliver some significant social outcomes and other uh, economic outcomes. So you imagine, uh, in some, this is all still being scoped, but perhaps if this really did become commercially and technically feasible, you could maybe build about 10 plants around New Zealand like this that would maybe substitute 10% of the crude that we import into New Zealand. So it has a profound effect on balance of payments and all that sort of stuff. Probably helps exporters because you know, we're not shipping so much stuff or buying so much stuff into the country. But equally, you imagine what it's like to a, to a town like Kawara, which for years and years has had a declining commercial base as the, as the mill, you know, the pulp and paper side of the business has been shrinking, shrinking incredibly, that if you started to build these plants in Kawaro, Gisborne, etc., places that have been shrinking, you can start to really deliver different sorts of social outcomes as well. So again, I think if you think about those gears, as much as I talked about those gears being available for change, equally they can be available for generating benefits uh, for New Zealand. So that's what we're into as well. Uh, that is a long-term thing. As I said, we'd, we'll do the study. And if it takes off, it might take us three or, you know, two or three years to build the plant, and then you know, it might be another decade or more before New Zealand has you know, more than one plant, even if we get to the point of making the decision to build the first one. So that's, what, that's, that's second generation biofuels. And part of the reason why that's a bit tricky, it's a little bit like the debate between VHS and beta. I look around the room, probably half of you don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, like old people's technology, yeah, when we used to do things on videotapes. And so there is a, a lot of technology out there around how you can convert these, these uh, waste materials into a bio-product, but actually you know, we want to be careful we pick the winner. We want to make sure we go down the VHS route rather than go and build a beta plant and eventually it dies out because it was a beta plant as opposed to it was a great idea, we just applied the wrong technology. And of course we've got this, the big challenges, you know, as I mentioned earlier, no government mandate or incentive, there's no consumer pull for it, people won't pay a premium for it, I've got to be responsible as a business leader in terms of the economic outcomes I have to deliver to my shareholders, and now I don't, have, I don't just have two, I've got you know, thousands of shareholders that I have to make sure that I'm responsible for. And the economics on this stuff are really, really poor, below $100 a barrel. And I've spent part of my time with you tonight telling you about why it's not going to be $100 a barrel anymore. Yeah, so again, it's, it's a bust. But part of the reason why we want to provide thought leadership and take advantage of being invited to forums like this is to let people know that we're open for business in this space that we don't know how to get a lot of things done, and we very much like to work with innovators, technologists, venture capital people, protagonists, NGOs, people who care, consumers, I mean, so the list goes on. We'd very much like to work with a wide diversity of people, because I believe that that diversity might open up a way through this stuff. Because it won't be as simple as just, you know, put the numbers in a discounted cash flow and that'll give you the answer. There's a lot more at stake here. A little example of how we're reducing the use of uh, fossil fuels. Uh, and th this, is, this is really, really cl uh, clever stuff. Uh, we've got people who can consult on how to help companies run their trucking fleet. We've got technology that enables us to monitor what drivers are doing. And we can go out there and package that up on a web-based service that gives all, captures all the data through the stuff called telematics, which is a fancy way of saying the GPS in your car, and models what truck drivers do. And there's some amazing stuff that we've already uncovered around this. Uh, we've got 12 pilots underway at the moment, and in some cases, we went, again, when you go along to your customers and say, please can I partner with you because I want to find you a way to use less of my products. So, you know, when, particularly when you're dealing with truck drivers, once you get past the invective that comes screaming back at you, you're then going to say, oh, no, no, but I'm serious. So in some cases, we've gone to customers and we've, we've, we've not only indicated how much we can save them, we've underwritten it. 
We said, we think we can save you $200,000 a year in, in fuel. And if we don't deliver on that, we'll write you a check for the difference. But what we'd like you to do is pay us more per litre because we're going to save you so much of your consumption. So in some cases, you've got to go out there and you've got to put a, a guarantee underneath it to get people into the game. Once you've got enough people into the game, then you've got more data, more empirical evidence that you can, that you can call upon. So we've got 12 pilots underway at the moment. And there's some fascinating stuff. Uh, do you realise that for every uh, 10 kilometres an hour you drive, if you're on the open road, extra 10 kilometres an hour you drive, you consume 10% more fuel? So every extra 10 kilometres consumes 10% more fuel. There's, uh, there's one particular experience we had where uh, we've, we've discovered that uh, this one particular truck driver was consuming 31% more fuel than he needed to because of harsh braking. Stop, start, stop, start. You know, driving much more aggressively than he needed to. So again, one of the benefits of this when you get people to use less of your products is they drive safer. And again, you lead to some superior social outcomes. So this is, this is um, uh, really, really cool, cool stuff here. Uh, we've got a, we participate at the Sustainability Business Showcase. It happens down at the cloud every October. I think a couple of weeks' time we're down there again. And we've got this piece of kit. It's an eco-driving simulator. And you get in there and it, it teaches you through six videos how to drive, how to improve your driver behaviour and you learn 12 driving techniques and it will enable people to change their behaviour and reduce their use of our products. So again, really, really good stuff. We have a couple of challenges around that. Uh, one is if you go out to New Zealanders and tell them, particularly consumers, and say, look, I found a way for you to do, use less of my products but you have to do this. You sound very much like Nanny State and the size of your shower head and all that sort of stuff. So that doesn't get you too far. So we're trying to find a way to think actually what's the gamification that we can bring to this because Kiwis love to compete against themselves, against their mates, against some benchmark. So we're trying to find a way to take the behaviour change that we need, turn it into a game and maybe that's how we get to where we get to. So that's the first challenge is how do you get consumers into this in a way that doesn't sound like nanny state. Then the second thing which is much more profound for me, how do I do this in a way with both my commercial customers and my consumers that having taught them and, and got them to use less of our products and pay me a slight premium for it, they then don't say, thanks Mike, now I'm going to go across town to the other guys who didn't teach me that because they're going to sell it to me cheaper anyway. So there's a competitive aspect to this as well. And again, that's why I mean, this is where we're stuck. We know we can do this stuff, we know it would help, but gee, we could be competitively disadvantaged. Hmm. Should we really do that or not? But there's some very, very good stuff that we're, we're doing here. Uh, we found one guy in, the, in, uh, in Southland in summertime uh, who ran his truck all day long. Right? He'd, he'd go to work, um, he was part of a contracting company, he'd go to work, park the truck up all day long and leave the truck running because it was a, it was a chilly bin. Right? He didn't want his sandwiches to curl up so he kept the air conditioning on in the truck all day long. <laughs> I'll tell you what, the fleet manager didn't know about that and because he'd been doing it for years and years and years there was no change, there was no increase in consumption but when you put this clever stuff in there and you have consultants and you, and you web base the whole thing, it's all real time, then you get to start to make better decisions about how to manage your fleet. So we're, we're into action around all this stuff and it's all good value. Uh, but as I said, we have to be responsible about things. And here's a, here's a great way to put it, I think. So even if, we, even if we've got this completely wrong, that there is no such thing as climate change and, and we don't need to work our way away from fossil fuels, you know, as, as the speech bubble says, you know, what if it's a big hoax and we create a better world for nothing? So, so there is more on the go here than just reducing carbon intensity, weaning ourselves off fossil fuels. There's a bigger game that's available to us. But that's still in that paradigm called I've got to, you know, I, I and my team have to run a good business, we have to be responsible to our shareholders, and we have to be economically sustainable. So it's pointless us being socially and environmentally sustainable if we're not economically sustainable, because that means we won't be here in the long term to really take whatever steps are needed to go beyond where we are today. So thank you very much for your time. <laughs>